It's here! It's finally here! The final video in the series. How fitting to end on the newest type. Every fairy type Pokemon explained? More like pre-order this t-shirt because once this month is over they're gone for good and you'll never have an opportunity to get them again. <laughs> yeah. So as this series comes to an end, I must say, thanks for watching and stuff. And also, we have a sequel series or two coming out, such as covering every single move. And also, this series isn't 100% finished. We're still going to do a corrections and additional notes video after this one because we missed quite a lot of things. I mean, that happens when you try to explain 800 of anything in a timely manner. Also, we're going to do a semi-remake of a few of these, mainly the first few, because the focus of the series actually shifted entirely about a quarter of the way through. Steel and Rock weren't exactly about explaining the origins of every Steel and Rock type Pokemon. They were about finding out what kind of rock or metal the Pokemon were actually made of instead. So because the focus was different than what the whole series wound up becoming, uh, a lot of the mods got glossed over. So after Sword and Shield come out, we're going to remake just a few of the really early ones and also rename those early ones to better fit with what they actually are. And then we're going to have a feature length omnibus of all of them, including all of the Gen 8 Pokemon and all of the corrections and additions and everything. It's gonna be a lot of work, but it's gonna be fantastic. Now then, I've almost filled an entire page of the script and we haven't even gotten started. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually fill the page now to say that I won't be explaining exactly what the fairy type is in this video because that took forever and we already explained it in this video here. So there you go. In this video that you're watching currently, we are answering the question, what are the origins and inspirations of every fairy type Pokemon? Why were they given the fairy type? And which ones should really not be? Let's get going. The myths of fair folk from across cultures and around the world are filled with deceptively deadly tricksters leading the unwary with illusions, disguises, and dazzling lights. And as such, some fairy type Pokemon often delve into this darker side of fairy lore. While most fairy type Pokemon are, like most fairies in legend and lore, nature spirits that love nature and hate the metal and pollution of industry, there are some fair folk and some fairy Pokemon that live alongside us humans. So most, if not all fairy type Pokemon can be divided into two groups. Those that live in a symbiotic relationship with humanity and those that live far, far away from us in the wildest of untamed habitats and fiercely defend nature from man which gives us some semblance of categories to work with. So let's start with fairy Pokemon that live alongside humans. And what better Mon to start with than the very first fairy Pokemon we saw, Sylveon. If you take really nice care of your Eevee with Pokemon Ami or Refresh and teach it a fairy type move, thus have it tap into the sacred mysterious magic of the fairy realm, then it will evolve into a Sylveon, clearly a domesticated fey creature. Sylveon's name comes from Sylvan, meaning forest dweller, often of the fey variety, and also from Sylph, a sky fairy that purifies the air and has wind magic. Then its name in Japanese, Nymphion, references nymphs, which are elemental nature fairies with a sex addiction. No wonder Rayman's nymphs were, uh... That. And also, no wonder Sylveon's default ability is Cute Charm, which seduces Pokemon of the opposite sex. Nymphs can pull elemental power from the environment around them, so there are nymphs of all sorts, which may relate to Eevee's whole evolution thing, perhaps, making Sylveon the perfect Pokemon to reveal for the new type first. So, what sort of environment could create this? Well, Ones filled to the brim with girly love and an attunement for nature mana. Some other pampered pets are Snubble, Granbull, Swirlix, and Slurpuff. There are fairy dogs in folklore throughout Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, though the Coo Sith is likely the main one referenced here and is the most famous. It is said to be a hound about the size of a young bull. It's green or white, may or may not be spectral, has braided hair, and brings people to the afterlife like the Grim Reaper, which it doesn't exactly sound like these Pokemon. Pokemon, but it's about the only fairy dog there is. But I mean, Snubble and Granbull were both listed as the fairy Pokemon since conception, long before the fairy type existed. So this had to be what they had in mind, right? Kusith directly translates to 
fairy dog, after all. And bulldogs came from the United Kingdom, which is where this folktale comes from. There you go. Swirlix and Slurpuff them are the same, I suppose. Though, <laughs> selectively bred beyond disbelief, it's now a cotton candy dog, likely referencing the British word for the treat, fairy floss. And Slurpuff is a cream puff dog, specifically a... French word. It's my French impersonation. It's a French dessert. One that happens to be very popular in Japan, but the Japanese put a little spin on it. A spin that makes it look just like this Pokemon. And they have their own word for it, which translates to fairy cake. Oh jeez, that's the reason? That's really the reason. All right. Next is the fan favorite family of Igglybuff, Jigglypuff, and Wigglytuff, which are a cross between moon rabbits, singing fairies, and balloons. As seen in the Detective Pikachu movie, they actually have soft rabbit fur. But I mean, of course they have fur. What else would this be? A tumor? Imagine having balls on your forehead. These Pokemon can inflate their bodies like frogs and pufferfish and Kirby, which come to think of it is quite fairy-esque himself. They do this to float around the air, as per some old fairy stories of fairies that don't act actually fly of their own accord, but rather catch and ride the winds. You could think of these Pokemon as balloons with minds of their own. Many fey creatures in folklore and myth loved singing, and sometimes even performing for humans. And sometimes these songs are not only beautiful, but enchantingly powerful. Like the songs of fairies and mermaids in ancient legend, they can do everything from lull whoever hears them to sleep, seduction, or death. Sometimes all three. And I mean, Jigs can do that. It can learn Parish Song. There are a few folk tales of performing fey creatures who would curse any human who isn't impressed by their performance. Similarly, Jigglypuff gets very offended if the audience falls asleep during its song, in the anime at least. Another family of street performer Pokemon is Mime Jr. and Mr. Mime, illusionist mage fairies who can create illusions and bring them to life. However, for their street performances, they prefer the much tamer acts of imitation and pantomime. To mime, but Mr. Mime is very proud of its act and will slap an unruly or bored audience member for their disrespect. Stop being rude! Pay attention to me! That's the voice I imagine. Mr. Mime having. Their fairy type likely stems from their use and mastery of magic, illusion, and trickery, all commonly associated with fairies. And they're also pink. Gotta, gotta note the pinkness. And actually come to think of it, they may be dolls or marionettes that came to life with a curse. Sort of Pinocchio style. I mean, that was done by a fairy, and it wouldn't be the only living doll Pokemon, would it? Altaria itself isn't fairy, but when it mega evolves it sure is, and mega evolving requires human assistance, which is why it's in this category. It's based on an old play, The Blue Bird, where two characters looked for the magical blue bird of happiness. And magic equals fairy, I suppose. There's also Peng, a Chinese mythical bird whose wings are said to be like clouds. So maybe that. Overall, I feel like the main reason it gets fairy is because, well, it would have been fairy instead of dragon type if the fairy type was a thing when they made this Pokemon. As both fairy and dragon are magical types, just different sorts of magic. But a full swap over from dragon to fairy would have made this the most drastic type change. So they had to switch flying instead, and only mega evolving at that. Another family of fairy avians is another iconic fan favorite. The family of Togepi, Togetic, and Togekiss. Which altogether represent the life cycle of birds. A new hatchling coming out of its egg, a fledgling chick, and a full-grown bird. They represent peace and happiness, which points to some dove inspirations. They avoid areas of conflict and seek peaceful areas, and they lack the sharp beaks and talons of real-life birds and most bird Pokemon. When they happen to be forced to battle, they strike mainly with their mystical fairy magic and wind powers, so perhaps they're also partially inspired on sylphs, the previously mentioned elusive wind fairies. They seek out kind and peaceful humans to raise them, and those who catch and raise them with with care, find themselves blessed with happiness. Quite the generic light fairy companion indeed. And then there's Spritzy and Aromatis, which basically are a cross between, uh, hummingbirds? Round flamingos, perfume bottles, and plague doctors? These Pokemon are prized by humanity for their power to perfume a room of any size in the most pleasant and enjoyable sense. Which kind of points to those plague doctor masks again. The reason they had these beak looking protrusions was to store dried herbs, flowers, and spices, which did multiple things. One, they masked the gross smells of decaying flesh and such when doctoring dying people and corpses. Two, it kept their faces a certain distance away from the corpses and stuff at all times. And three, they also believed that the plague was airborne. So then, clearly, 
By just masking the scent of the air, the doctors would be safe. They were wrong. So, these Plague Doctor masks smelled really good, which may be why these Pokemon have them too. They smell really good. Aromatisse also has inspirations from flamenco or can-can dancers. Those dancers who scandalously reveal their legs. Ho oh, ho oh, oh. ho! Leg! And? Uh... Well, you might have noticed, nothing here really screams fairy, does it? Yeah, no, I don't really think this Pokemon has origins that make its typing valid? I mean, it smells nice and is very feminine. Those are pretty normal things. So I kind of think mono normal would have been a much better type for these things. There is an argument to be had that they should be normal flying, but I agree with Game Freak in not giving them the flying type. Spritzy can fly, but is not great at it, and that's not at all what it's about. But while the origins don't give it a good reason, it it does at least utilize the type well, tapping into fairy magic with most of its moves. I guess this goes into what I was hoping to avoid. Game Freak sees the fairy type often as the pink type, or the we want to get more little girls into Pokemon type. I say. But that's not to say I can't pull a reason out of my butt. Fairies are often associated with both femininity and nature. Often flowers. And flowers smell nice. Boom! Aromatisse is fairy type. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum with Mimikyu, which is based on a mix of fairy legends, ghost stories, and even eldritch horror. It just wants your love and attention. All of it! But it can't approach anyone in its horrific true form. It's like a Lovecraftian horror. A mere mortal cannot lay eyes on it, for one cannot comprehend its true form. He was so ugly that everyone died! The end. <laughs> SpongeBob. But no, really, it's so bad looking that if a human were to see its true form, they would die, which is similar to a lot of Mimikyu's Pokedex entries. Yet, despite this curse, it craves attention, and that pesky yellow rat is always getting all of the attention, so Mimikyu makes itself a little Halloween costume of Pikachu in hopes of making friends. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Pika Fairy coin is Dedene, Dedena, Dedene, which, besides being another adorable little pest that chews up people's cabling, on the surface, it looks like it's just a gerbil. That's what I always think. And I'm very commonly mistaken in assuming it's monoelectric. But no, electric fairy. And to explain its fairy typing, we need to look at the region it comes from, Kalos, which is based on France. This is important because the French tooth fairy is a mouse. Fairy mice are things in French folklore. And one of them is the tooth fairy. Go figure. Ralts, Curlia, Gardevoir, and Mega Gardevoir are, well, they're very unique Pokemon, actually. Their shape may be inspired by Anasama Ningyu, thin Japanese paper dolls, but that doesn't explain much. Their Pokedex entries somewhat imply a guardian angel aspect, which would be fitting of the fairy type as an equivalent to light magic. It could also pull inspiration from the conjured familiar spirit, a supernatural entity that would assist witches originally, though through extension are now common in folk and fairy tales, such as Puss in Boots and the Frog Prince. So that would point towards the fairy type already, and it would almost point to their almost ghostly appearance with the dress thing and all. Though another possibility is that they are embodiments of magic. They are mages. I mean, they are fairy and psychic type. That sounds very very magical to me. It just screams magic user. The other waifu fairy mon, which sounds like a Digimon name, waifu fairy mon, is Mawile, which fits the common fairy trope of deceptively cute and deadly. Think about captivating beautiful fairy lights luring you into a trap. Think of super cute nymphs and sirens attracting you to come closer and closer until they eat you. It's a very common folklore and fairy tale trope. The front of Ma Wile brings you in, and the back bites down. It is also, of course, inspired by the Futakuchi Ona, a yokai that is a woman with a mouth in the back of her head and can magically move her hair around. Both of these aspects point to the fairy typing pretty well. And then, Klefki! Ugh. They could have done something so much cooler with the same concept. Klefki also pulls from the darker, more mischievous side of fairy lore. It likes to play tricks and steal people's keys. That's also why it has the prankster ability. It's simple. It's a steel fairy. Comfey is similar, but with flowers instead of keys, so it's more of a nature spirit than a mischievous trickster goblin. It uses these flowers to make lays, a traditional Hawaiian symbol of hospitality. Flowers in all sorts of folklore are commonly associated with fairies, as flowers are magical power sources to them, and are often used for light magic, such as healing. Simple. And finally, we come to Magirna, 
an automaton, a, quote, scientist, unquote, it's totally an alchemist, 500 years in the past created the Soul Heart by collecting life energy from Pokemon. This is a thing that a few alchemic machines are said to be capable of doing to human and animal souls. Some alchemists also wrote theories on how they could then attach these souls to physical objects, or transfer them from one body to another to essentially live forever. You know, it's just the same thing that inspired a major plot point in Full Metal Alchemist, and even the second most important character. But nah, Pokemon doesn't want to say alchemist. It's too on the nose, so they say scientist. <laughs> Color me salty. Anyway, the soul heart is the true body of Magirna. The rest of its body is an automaton, robot-esque thing that it controls. It is also super in tune with the well-being and emotions of those around it, which combined with the point that it's just a soul says fairy type, I suppose. It took some level of light magic to attach a soul after all. But at the same time, I could totally see Magirna as mono steel. I mean, it only learns a single fairy type move, but there's nothing really wrong with it having fairy. I'm just saying. Oh, and I should also mention the nursemaid inspirations. This thing was a gift from the scientist to the royal family, and during this time period, nursemaids were common among noble families to help raise kids, and Magirna has the traditional nursemaid hat, and puffy shoulders, and gown, and its caring demeanor makes it perfect to be a nursemaid, and it's a nursemaid robot. Interesting. And that was that category, Pokemon based on fey things that traditionally would be around or get involved with humans. The others are the opposite. Now, even if the Pokemon themselves are plenty involved with human society, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about their inspirations here. And a lot of fey creatures would do absolutely everything in their power to be as far away from human activity as possible. Because they hate us, and our steel, and our fire. Ick. Fun fact! You know how horseshoes are considered lucky? That's because people believed that if your horse happens to be wearing horseshoes, it would keep fey creatures away while you traveled, and they also wouldn't follow your tracks. Therefore, they wouldn't be all mischievous with you. They wouldn't mess with you. You were lucky. Those horseshoes, they're made of steel, and fairies hate steel. It's poison to them. So up first, let's use Flabebe, Floette, and Florgis as an example. In Pokémon, they tend to human gardens all the time. They don't really mind us, but their main inspiration would avoid humans at all cost. Think about your standard, modern-day, pop culture nature fairy. Think Fern Gully. There you go. Standard fairies of the forest. Embodiments of nature and its powers. They love mushrooms and flowers. Especially since, again, flowers are magic. You could also say that they are inspired by the Anthosai, Greek flower nymphs said to have an array of flowers for hair. It's also worth noting that Florgis' hair is reminiscent of the poof hairstyle, popularized by the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette. Floette's flower resembles a parasol, also common for noble women of the day, and Flabebe has a wreath of flowers on its head, common of nature fairies, especially of Anthea, Greek goddess of flowers. I mentioned mushrooms earlier. It's pretty well known now that fairies like mushrooms, so the connection connection to Moralol and Sheetonic is easy. In particular, they appear to be mushrooms of the Mycena genus with its bioluminescence and all. They take the form of a lamp and a nightlight, but their fairy typing is due to the fairy's connection with mushrooms. Bioluminescent shrooms were once considered fairy fire, and went by that name. And of course, there were fairy rings. Rings of mushrooms. They naturally grow this way because the shrooms figured out it's the best way to find food underground, but in the old days it was believed to have been caused by fae activity. Sheetonic is also known for creating lights in the woods that lead people astray, which again points to mischievous fairies, as well as fairies that want to keep people away by having them follow little will-of-the-wisps trails off into the distance. But what would they want to lead the people away from? Well, maybe the heart of the forest, or the magical tree of life. Xerneas. This Pokémon is fairy-type incarnate, entirely light nature magic, and pulls inspiration not just from the stags around Yggdrasil, the Norse Tree of Life, but also Cernunos, the Celtic god of life and fertility, hence the name and the antlers. There's also the Cyrenian Hind of Greek myth, a legendary deer with antlers made of gold and hooves of copper or brass. And of course, there's also the X inspiration, the 3D plane, and the Hinduism, but I'll save all that for the explanation in this video here detailing all of the XYZ legendary trio. Now then, Contini and Whimsicott are also nature sprites, and ones that really do blow with the wind rather than full-on fly by themselves. They may be partially inspired by the vegetable lamb of Tartary, a myth in the Middle Ages about a plant that grows sheep for fruit? 
yeah. It was used to explain the abundance of cotton in the air. Because, you know, cotton is the same thing as wool? Man, people were dumb. This connection to sheep also works well, since Whimsicott is part of Unova's horoscope. And it's also got these little horn-looking things. It's like a tiny ram. Whimsicott is said to be mischievous, like many fey creatures, which, along with its brown coloration, points us to the Saki of Brazilian folklore, a fey creature that plays pranks, lives in forests, and blows around with the winds. Now, speaking of mischievousness, that basically explains Impidimp as well. It's an imp, it's in the name. And dark fairy type is just the perfect type for an imp, right? Basically, every definition of an imp says it's a fairy crossed with a demon. Dark fairy, for sure. They are full of mean-spirited pranks and are found in all sorts of folklore. Now, Primarina, uh, it's Primarina. I mean, it's a siren mermaid seal, enchanting songs and all. There you go. Carbink and Deontzi are based on the Carbuncle, which you should definitely uh, do not look that up on Google Images. No, don't do it. Stop. <clears throat> you really gotta specify the gemstone. The carbuncle is, depending on who you ask, either a magical fey creature that grows gemstones out of itself, or refers to an actual gemstone, one imbued with magic that causes it to illuminate the area. And look at the Yu-Gi-Oh carbuncle! It's so cute! Clefairy, Clefable, and Clefa it shouldn't have taken me this long to get to. It's about as fairy as you can get. I mean, it's in the name. Fairy. Fable. Fa. They are sort of just Globular generic pixies, which is implied by their Japanese names, P, 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 and Pixie. Sheesh. Generic as they may be, they at least got some lore. These Pokemon are heavily associated with the moon. I mean, it's said that they come from the moon. The Pokemon Crystal Pokedex entry says, Though rarely seen, it becomes easier to spot, for some reason, on the night of the full moon. This is perfect. The moon has a lot to do with fairy folklore. Firstly, in a broad sense, it's said that the moon makes magic more powerful, and a full moon is when it is at its most powerful. So, fairies and fey creatures and witches would all come out and have higher activity levels during a full moon. Some even say that the moon is a portal to the fairy realm, and that's why fairy magic gets more powerful. More magic is leaking out of it, and that's funny to me for some reason. Alolan Ninetales? Well, now that I think about it, regular Ninetales should probably have the fairy type too. But it's fine that they saved it for the Alolan variety. Alolan Ninetales, just like regular Ninetales, is based on the Japanese fairy tale of Kyubi no Kitsune, a kitsune of advanced age whose fur has turned silver gold, and after it gets all nine of its tails, it becomes godlike, omnipotent. Kitsunes are from Japanese folklore, and are very reminiscent of Western fairy tale creatures. Really, both versions should have the fairy type, but Alolan Ninetales is more magical looking, so it's fine. But speaking of Alola, the Tapus, Tapu Koko, Tapu Lele, Tapu Fini, and Tapu Bulu, are the four guardians of Alola. They are based on the main four gods of Hawaiian mythology, Ku, Lono, Kanaloa, and Cain. And these four gods are basically nature spirits incarnate, guardians of the land and its natural powers. And as I go over in this video where I discuss what would happen if fairy type was never added, you can't really take the fairy type away from these guys. It perfectly fits them. Magical guardians of nature using the magical power of nature to do their job? Yeah. And coming soon, I'll have a video all about their connections to those Hawaiian gods. Now my favorites, Cutie Fly and Rabambi. Oh, they're so cute. I love the Bombalide bee flies that they're based on too. I've seen them. Super cute, buzzing around in your face. All right, maybe not buzzing around in your face, but buzzing around near you so you can see them, but not in your face. These flies aren't really associated with fairies. So in the case of cutie fly, you could definitely argue that it shouldn't be fairy type beyond the fact that it's cute, I suppose. But Rabambi takes the bee fly and adds some generic sprite or pixie elements to it. It's got little pollen puffs to spread fairy dust around and stuff. And I guess with its generic nature in mind, I suppose Cutie Fly has sprite, pixie, fairy wings instead of fly wings after all. So fairy type still works for both. Mega Audino, but not Audino, is also fairy type. Valuable sentence, as if you didn't gather that by me mentioning it. Just comparing it to its regular form, the Mega certainly looks a lot more fairy-esque. Audino is this weird sort of pig, rabbit, elephant? And when Omega evolves, the rabbit elements really start to shine through with its extra, really tall, big ears. 
and the extra puffball tail on its chest. Rabbits, especially white ones, are a common thing in fairy tales and folklore. Think about the Easter Bunny, Lucky Rabbit's Feet, Pukas, which are white Celtic spirits that would commonly take the appearance of a rabbit, and more. Plus, Audino is all about healing and good fortune, both of which are associated with light magic, thus fairy type. And that healing thing explains why it's got a little stethoscope and a little nurse outfit with strange Lolita boots. Hmm. But... Speaking of rabbits, Azumarill, the water rabbit, and its family, Meryl and Azurill, they... Uh, well, let's just say we've reached the sort of not category. I mean, there is the connection to rabbits, yes, and water rabbits are a thing, sort of. Apparently there are rabbits that live in swamps, but I mean, is that fairy-esque? No. But I mean, yeah, rabbits and mice are common in fairy tales, and fairies sometimes ride them. But I mean, people ride horses. And that doesn't make horses human type, now does it? Yeah, that's my argument, deal with it. Man, I gotta rationalize this. Uh, most fairy type Pokemon are pink, and Meryl was originally conceptualized as pink, so there's that. Is it really just because it's cute and they needed at least one more fairy type Pokemon to not have pink on it? Well, uh, all of their names in Japanese reference Lapis Lazuli, an azure stone of water filled with myth. For instance, the Assyrians described it as a stone of great power. King Solomon was said to have a ring crafted out of it by an angel that allowed him to control demons. The Babylonians have legends about a tree that grows precious stones instead of leaves, and at the very top is Lapis Lazuli. In Sumerian mythology, the goddess Inanna roamed the underworld and would use rods made of pure Lapis Lazuli to measure the length of someone's life. In all of these beliefs and more, it's said to be sort of a flesh of the gods. And I mean, that's all fine and dandy, but that doesn't exactly point towards this H2O molecule with a face having fairy powers. The closest we get is that the Egyptians, Akkadians, and other Mesopotamians would make seals and amulets out of them. So magical ornaments, most commonly things like the evil eye talisman. I guess if you take that and add ears and a stupid tail, you get Meryl. <laughs> I don't think this line has any good reasons for being fairy type, when the only connection is their color and their names in a single language. They would be much better normal water or just water like they used to be. Meaning they would be much better not fairy type. There. I had to say it at least once this episode because it's the grand finale! But that, like I said, doesn't mean we're done. We're going to do a correction and additions video as well as remaking two or three of the really early ones after Gen 8 comes out. And of course, we're going to cover every Gen 8 Pokemon in another video and then combine all of them. And we also, of course, have our sequel series that already has a couple episodes. It covers every Pokemon move. And there's also another sequel series where we're covering what the types are? How they work? There's already a Dragon and Fairy one of that, so check that out. And thank you so, <laughs> so much for watching this series, it's become our most popular and my favorite series that we've done so far. But I feel like the upcoming ones will keep on being better and better, so be sure to subscribe and be sure to pre-order this limited time offer t-shirt. And of course, be sure to never stop using your noggin.